Uh, my name is Hanan Tukhan. Um, I work at the University of London um, School of Oriental and African Studies. Um, I've been teaching at the politics department, um, but my focus is on visual, the visual arts basically, um, vi visual culture production in various forms, but my special interest is probably in the visual arts. Um, uh, I'm really glad I'm here today, um, and I'm glad that Sandy um, gave me this opportunity to come and speak to you all. Um, because I'd like to discuss with you some of what I've been thinking about over the past few years about how the political or what we understand as the political is linked up with our understanding of what is visual. Um, this is a growing field, uh, a very growing field. You probably all noticed, um, this is probably related to um, what we saw or what was triggered by the Arab um, revolutions which started in 2011. We saw an, a burst of imagery and a burst of visuals um, related to people, power, public space. Um, so, I mean, a lot of people have said that the Palestinians, you know, were somehow the pre precedent to a lot of this um, since they've always been using their spaces, especially in the camps and in their cities, um, in order to speak to each other, in order as well to oppose um, Israeli resistance and, uh, sorry, oppose Israeli oppression and the occupation. But before I begin, um, I'd like to just, I wanna, I'll, I'll tell you a bit about, a bit more about my research. Um, I spent some time in Lebanon working on the issue of uh, cultural funding um, and the arts um, and how international organizations um, basically are involved in producing um, culture uh, in Lebanon. Um, so I looked at the different, how this sort of affects how our relationship to art, how we speak about art and our perceptions and understandings of culture and cultural production and what this might mean and how it's tied up to institutions of power. Um, so this is a bit about myself and I want to just know, a bit, like if you could introduce yourselves briefly to me it would be great, um, just so I know, you know, where you're coming from and what some of your ideas might be. And then I'll tell you a bit, get into a bit more detail about what we'll be talking about. Um, so, do you want to start? My name is Ayat. I'm 25 years old. I studied teaching English at the University. Is Ala Al Hamous, Khayyam Al Azza, Khadros Lizi, Bijan. Okay, so excellent. So we had a mixed group of. Uh, people and some of you have done are doing art and philosophy which should help in this and psychology which should help in some of what we're talking about. Um, okay so just uh, to go back again um, there's this quickly developing field like I was talking about um, before we did the introductions um, on the visual cultural studies of the Middle East it's very much tied up to tied up with the um, with the Arab revolutions um, and uh, what the Arab revolutions triggered in terms of images um, and visuals over the past year um, um, I'll say very quickly here that these visualities, and I'll come back to this point a bit, uh, a bit later on, were most pronounced in two ways. Firstly, in Arab citizens' reclamation of public space and public discourse through much of the graffiti and illustration on walls um, that emerged during these revolutions. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen a lot of these images. Um, and secondly, through the public performance of resistance. Um, dissent and the refusal, the utter refusal of the regimes of thought and systems that have governed the lives or the lives of these participants in the revolutions for the most part since independence. Um, this is probably best embodied in, embodied in Muhammad Bouazizi's famous image of his self-immolation as a form of protest. And I'd probably argue that another good representation of the sweeping mood of change and dissent are the ga gatherings of the masses of people in public squares and streets that have traditionally been dominated only by the images and sculptures and presence in general in one way or another of the ousted leaders. So in some sense, um, these public spaces were dominated by the images of these leaders and what the revolutions did is that they switched this around. So now what we see is the average citizen um, or the average individual that was somehow looking on onto these spaces now very much central to these spaces. Um, okay, so despite the sudden interest in Middle Eastern studies or including the visual in the larger discipline of Middle Eastern studies um, that's, you know, that's become more pronounced lately as of late since the re revolution, for many of us from this part of the world or for the more inquisitive academics um, uh, interested in understanding this part of the world through a more critical lens, um, reflective or more reflective of the actual realities on the ground, much of this boom in literature on the visual production of the Arab Spring only confirms 
what we've always known. And this is that social movements and social change in the region cannot be understood only through people's relationship to formal politics. Um, when Traditionally, when studying the Middle East, the term politics, or al-siyasa, has tended to mean formal politics, the type of politics associated with governance structure, top-down political structures of regimes, the formal political parties, formal civil society. And while all this is, you know, it's, it's important, it's not sufficient by itself, because we also need to give attention to the kind of daily politics, the daily work that human beings undertake, often incrementally, slowly, to try and change their own lives. Um, and work against systems which intentionally keep them marginalized and keep them on the mar and keep them keep them marginalized. Um, I would argue that a big part of this daily politics of resisting power, in whatever form it exists, is imagination. It is important to study, and for this reason, it is important to study how people visualize power and how they see themselves as political agents in resisting it in one way or another. And this is why I really was excited about coming here and possibly and hopefully discussing some of this stuff with all of you. And I know that you've, you know, um, as at least in Adhesh, where some of you are from and the other camps, there's been, I mean, you've probably grown up with a lot of these images that um, we're talking about, images of resistance. And um, So Asif Bayat, I don't know if any of you read the um, readings that are on the recommended readings text, but Asif Bayat, who's on the, who is on the list, uh, and whose, li whose book Life is Politics is one author, for instance, that has used extent extensive longitudinal field research on Egypt and Iran to show how social change in the Middle East occurs bottom up through imaginative and creative, non formal and non organized movements, and how political agency comes from this ability to quietly challenge established power structures in society by sidestepping the boundaries and legal framework set up precisely in order to keep them marginalized. Um, I was, I mean, you could tell me, like, if, if you think of some examples, but here I thought of the examples of the creation of popular committees for alternative economic and social services during the first intifada, for example, um, as well as the informal committees and popular organization that took place or, or is probably still taking place in several Arab, unrecognized Arab villages inside of Isra Israel as a way of providing them with the basic services that Israeli state fails to do. Um, so, so a lot of this is informal planning that goes around, um, that, tries to, um, uh, that tries to counter um, the state's marginalization of them or the state's, let's say the state's um, ab ability to or need to ignore these um, communities. Um, and following from this, uh, I want to say that for peoples engaged in movements for change and struggles for freedom, uh, the potency and the Im or the importance of, of symbolism is undeniable. Um, expressing uh, resistance through imagery has the power to trigger anti-establishment sentiment, to mobilize potential activism, and most, most importantly, it has the ability to articulate a repertoire or a collection of popular demands and rights. So what it does, it, 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 if, if these, ima you know, these imaginations are in people's minds, when you see them visually written or, um, or somehow represented um, through an artwork, it, it sort of gives an articulation to, to, to what you're imagining or what is being processed in the, in the, in the mind. Uh, for Palestinians, and we all know this, uh, for example, the key Handala, Mahmoud Darwish, the village, Layla Khaled, the Kufiya, and among so much more, um, has come to sim symbolize the, uh, the century-long struggle against colonialism and imperialism. Cultural production in Palestine is part and parcel of this struggle and can never be read comprehensively, or the struggle can never be read comprehensively or fully unless in relation to these symbols and their meanings. Um, so today, I want to focus on the visual aspect of cultural production as opposed to literature or the theater, for example, that have been more, uh, and poetry, that have been more predominate, pre that have predo tended to predominate as forms of cultural resistance to Israeli um, oppression. Um, and more specifically, I want to talk about this notion that we keep hearing uh, about that this notion that we keep hearing about um, of reclaiming the public space through art and the circulation Im of images. What does it mean to reclaim public space? 
And how does this affect how we see our world, how we practice dissent against hegemony? How do images push us to mobilize around social and political injustice issues? Uh, what are the mechanics of this reclamation? And how does it relate to the larger field of what is often termed um, the political? Um, so I'll say here that even though our focus is more on the contemporary forms of visual production, we can, th we can think about some of these questions in relation to the more conventional and historical uses of poetry, literature, and theater, which have very much defined the history of the struggle so far. So if you have any, you know, any points that you want to um, uh, br uh, raise about this and comparing the, the contemporary visual, of, for example, the graffiti, um, uh, and compare it to what we know uh, as poetry and literature, what we have come to understand about them, then please feel free to do that. Okay. Um, the theoretical frameworks I want to discuss with you are related to some emerging com concepts in the field of visual cultures and political action or political space, which include, firstly, um, the political as a space, okay, and the politics of aesthetics that occurs within it. Now, I translated the politics of aesthetics as siyasiyat uh, al I don't know if it's, uh, we can probably discuss this afterwards in our discussion. Um, and the second is the public performance of affect. Affect, the meaning of affect being the act of moving or stirring the emotions and sensations of someone. Um, so, yes, yeah, so the public performance of affect and what could be described as a resultant poeti poetics of resistance. And again, some of what we've seen um, over the past uh, year with the Arab uh, revolutions and what they've triggered. Um, and thirdly, the politics of production, circulation, and discourse of the arts and visual culture production more broadly. So once an image is produced, which audiences have access to it? How do they receive it? How is it framed, spoken about, and referred to, etc.? The examples or case studies that I'd like to discuss with you are related to different mediums of visuals, um, and we can add to those if you uh, feel free um, to tell me if you think we need to add something here. Uh, these will include um, wall graffiti during the first intifada or uh, versus graffiti on the apartheid wall after the second intifada and the internationalization or how it's linked up to the internationalization of the Palestinian struggle. Um, and secondly, some of the notable images, some of the most notable images from the Arab Spring. Um, and three, images from the March to Palestine Day that took place last year. Do you, and you all remember this? Yeah? No? No? The March to Palestine images on Land Day. Um, Okay, uh, and lastly, art production in the form of a book, which is on the uh, key text uh, list, and it's called The Subjective Map of Palestine, which allows us to see Palestine in a way we could not or did not know we, we could. Um, and I'll show you some of this in the... Um. Okay, so I just want to begin by unraveling some of the terms of the title of this talk, um, Reclaiming the Political, Visual Production, and the transformative politics of every day. What does this mean? The political and politics. How, how are they? How are they related? And how are they different? Okay. Um, first, what is known as the concept of the political examines the fundamental nature of the political as a space, and this space can be a physical or conceptual one. Um, the idea is that this space is always rife with tension, that it is, that is inherent to human nature, and that this tension is not necessarily a bad one or an unhealthy one, but rather a productive one, it's a good one, that may lead to an ongoing process of empowerment, action, change, and the rising consciousness. So the political, then, is the dimension of antagonism and strife and tension that is inherent to human relations and which works to sometimes resist or reinforce hegemonic uh, politics, or reinforce power, depending on how it manifests itself. So if we envision this political as a space where action and thought takes place, that may sometimes work to resist and other times reinforce the hegemonic and various, um, or various hegemonic layers we live under, we can then decode the layered symbols and the images around us to see how their reading might change over time and what in fact it is that they hide or what they choose to make visible to the eye and what they choose to keep invisible from us. 
Okay. Um, I'll move on to politics now and its meaning. Um, here I'm using uh, the definition of Chantal Mouffe, a Belgian theorist. Um, uh, and she's again, she's on your reading list as well. Uh, so Mouffe conceptualizes the term or thinks of the term uh, politics as the collection of dominant practices, discourses, and institutions, whether social, economic, cultural, political, that seek to establish a certain order and organize human existence or human coexistence in conditions that are always potentially conflictual. Um, so there's th the political and politics are always working together, okay? Uh, here. Um, if we think of the collective negative experience of Israeli occupation and the response to it in the form of dissenting and resistant graffiti, such as these, such as these images, which I should show you. Um, okay, so these are some, uh, maybe some of you have seen this. This one's in the Gaza Strip. Um, okay, so these are within the walls of of, of camps. Hailan Abkhalaji and Shabibel Fathawiya. So these are some of them, yeah? You want to look at them for a bit, or, yeah? Hi, Bidhesha. You know what it means and everything. You know what they were referring to, exactly. Who wrote it? You wrote it. Really? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. I'll just... Huh? making you dizzy. Okay. Um, in these images, okay, once you look at them, actually let me move on a bit to the, um, okay. Think of these images that I'm showing you here, and I know they're nothing compared to what's really out there, um, and what you probably see every day, and I'm seeing every day now that I'm here. But when we look at these images, uh, sorry, I just, um, Okay. Um, when we look at these images within the framework of what I'm talking about, what's hidden f from view of the life of the camp in these images, in images like this? What's hidden from you? you? Any, what, are, what are they telling you and what are they hiding?